Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for, for joining this uh, post-lunch session. It can be a bit challenging at times. Uh, my name is Dana Weinbaum, and here with me is uh, Jana Gorevich. We are both product managers with Ping Identity. We are part of the Ping ID team who focuses on uh, strong authentication and mobile development, and we're based off of Israel. Um, and today we'll talk about how you can combine the latest Ping's uh, FIDO passwordless adaptive policies and intelligent MFA across the organization for both mobile, uh, sorry, for both enterprise and consumer use cases. So, uh, so MFA is evolving. It is no longer just two-factor authentication for a while now. It takes into consideration multiple factors. It includes adaptive policies as part of the authentication flow in order to decide whether to step up the user or not. Uh, and it includes biometrics as part of the authentication process. It has to comply with different regulations for different industries. For example, for the health industry, we have different uh, regulations than what we have for the finance industry, for example. It has to deal with changing standards. We have new standards uh, all the time. And it deals with both, both enterprise and consumer use cases, which are very different and has uh, different requirements that needs to be met. Uh, also, MFA is becoming more intelligent as the next evolutionary step. And risk-based uh, decisions will be the core to MFA in the near future. And all the time, we need to remember uh, the user experience. As Andrew said this morning, user experience rules and while we always need to think about the security aspects, we also need to think about the user experience. And also yesterday, there were a lot of discussions about zero trust. Obviously, MFA can make it happen. Um, so during this session, we will use Smart Kitchen. This is a fictitious company. And we will use that to see how, with the help of Ping ID, you can implement MFA everywhere in a holistic way across uh, the organization. So Smart Kitchen, as the name implies, uh, manufactures smart kitchen appliances. It has different divisions with different uh, requirements and different use cases. And it also has a consumer uh, division that it needs to handle. So our first use case that we will deal with um, involves Alice. Alice, she's a finance executive and she's working from home. Uh, when the employee is working from outside the organization perimeter, it is a challenge to, first of all, allow him access to secure uh, data, uh, secure information. However, allow him a good uh, user experience uh, and in this example, you'll, you'll be able to see how with the help of FIDO architecture, we are able to provide passwordless biometric authentication for Alice. And when I say passwordless in this case, I really mean passwordless and usernet, userless. So uh, Alice doesn't have to type in her username or her password in order to uh, log in. So, Jana? So I'm about to show you a demo. And in this demo, um, let me just switch. It's a live demo, by the way. I'm going to um, show um, a simulation of the way um, Alice logs into her financial application. So um, let's think that that's the logging page for Alice's financial application. We can see that she has the traditional credentials that she can sign in with, her username and her password. And she can go with a better way, with the more seamless way of using Windows Hello in a passwordless and usernameless way. The reason we're seeing Windows Hello here is because I'm using a Windows computer. And Windows Hello is the native uh, FIDO authenticator for a Windows computer. If I would have done this presentation from a Mac, it would have said Touch ID. Or if I would have shown it to you from um, an Android phone, it would have said Android Biometrics. But for this example, um, it would be Windows Hello. So please pay attention to what is about to happen. It's going to happen really quickly. And after that, we can replay it and review the architecture of what happened behind the scenes. So I'm selecting Windows Hello. It recognizes me. It says, hello, Jana. I'm proving it. It fall back to security key because of WebAuthn. Let's try it again. 
Oh. New one, new one. Delete the last couple and of seconds. Jenna, you're not projecting. Jenna, you're not projecting for a reason. I'm not projecting. I don't know why. Did they ruin it? <laughs> Did they broke the room? Okay, but you just missed At the notification. It yeah. <laughs> it was so let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it again. Okay. Um, I'll try to go like far back so that the camera will catch me. I'm approving it. Yay, I'm authenticated. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so let's just review what just happened here. Let me go back to the presentation mode. OK. So uh, what you just saw was an integration uh, between Pink Federate and Pink ID. In Pink Federate, we had the policy. And that policy allows us to define the way the login page looks like. It allows us to define that there are the traditional login credentials, which are username and password. And it also allows us to say that there is another way to log in, and that would be with Windows Hello. Um, after the user, me, um, selected Windows Hello, it triggered the Ping ID adapter, and this adapter called Ping ID. In Ping ID, we have the uh, Fido Cloud Server. As you know, Fido, um, it's WebAuthn, it's setup, it comprises of authenticators, um, backend servers and browser support. So what happened here is because it was um, a user, a user nameless transactions and passwordless transaction, um, our FIDO server requested the platform authenticator, which is the Windows machine. Um, it told him, give me all of your user handles that were registered to this device. So what you just saw was just an authentication. Before I went and authenticated, I got myself registered and paired myself to that device. So my credentials were already stored in the FIDO server. And going back to that flow, so when the FIDO server requested user uh, handles from um, the platform, when this Windows machine told um, our FIDO server that Jana is the registered user. That way, we were able to return the user handle to the credential, map them back to the ping ID user, and that was the way we knew that this user can access. Oh, there is like a little hole here. <laughs> Not good for high heels. Um, what I was saying, okay. Um, and that way we were able to know that me, Jana, is a user, I can log into this financial application. So the request got back, the WebAuthn request was signed on the server, and um, I was approved. So this integration is just one example of integration with Ping Federate. If we would have wanted to do it all cloud, we would have done it with uh, Ping One for enterprise. Okay, so the next use case that we will uh, look into is Bill. Bill is an operation manager. He's working from uh, the manufacturing uh, facilities. Um, in some cases, and in this, as in this example, uh, mobile devices are not allowed. So in which case we need to provide Bill with another form of a hardware authenticator. Uh, there are multiple options for hardware authenticators. However, for this example, we will show a wearable FIDO-enabled authenticator, which are uh, the most secured, and will allow Bill a really slick uh, authentication and experience. So um, I don't know if you remember that Andre mentioned wearables today in his keynote. So we are going to demonstrate it. And in order to do that, I have here on the Motive Ring, I don't know if you can see that, that's just like um, a fitness-like tracker, activity tracker that comes in a form of a ring. And other than it being an activity tracker, it also does um, 2FA with FIDO. So um, 
I'm going to show you a video right now, not a live demo, <laughs> um, of how it works. Again, please pay attention. If we'll need, we'll uh, replay it, and we'll see what happened here. Why can't I play it? Oh, okay, please. Okay, um, so we're seeing here user logs in with username and password. This is the second factor of authentication, not passwordless as, as we've seen. Um, browser pops up the presence confirmation. User is spinning the ring. The ring lights, ring lights up, and the user is authenticated. It was that simple. Let's replay it. <laughs> Let's replay it. <laughs> Because I'm sure that you missed the details. Because it was so quick and easy. Um, how do I play it back? OK, like that. So again, um, login, username, and password. What's about to come is the second factor authentication. That's the browser, showing the browser notification, asking the user to confirm its presence with Bluetooth. The user is spinning the ring. It lights up. It sends the credentials. And the user is authenticated. That's how easy it is. So what happened here? So here we have the same uh, FIDO server as we saw on the first example, the same one that did the passwordless authentication. But now it has like an easier job to do because it got the user. So the user signed in with um, credentials. We send the username to the FIDO server. Um, it challenged with the credentials that he already like pre-registered like in the first example. So um, those credentials were sent to the browser. Uh, with the web authentication request, the browser started to look for authenticators. And the way the browser does it is with CTAP, which is the other part of uh, FIDO. And the ring was the present authenticator. The user was spinning the ring. The ring light up, sent the credentials back to the browser. Browser returned it back to the FIDO server, the sign challenge, and we authenticated the request. So um, the same thing works with security keys. The ring works in the same technology as a security key. We have security keys that are uh, working with Bluetooth. Uh, right now, Bluetooth is available on some of the browser. If you saw here, the, the video was filmed um, on a Chrome browser. You do need to go and turn on a feature flag in Chrome to enable it. Um, and we do have some security keys as a giveaway. So we're giving them away for those who will ask questions after the session. And we have a 30-day trial that you can go online and sign up and use those security keys and verify our FIDO service. Um, and another thing about um, those types of variables is that the ring is just one example. It's an example of a FIDO technology that can be embedded in multiple uh, wearables, and the wearable should fit the use case. For example, medical environments that uh, may need hands-free authentication, so it can be embedded in a bracelet, or maybe in some kind of tag on, um, on a piece of clothing, all depending on uh, the use case. So, um, so far we've seen um, two use cases that were enabled by FIDO. One of them was passwordless. The other one was second factor authentication, all um, implemented by FIDO with one FIDO server. Let's continue um, exploring additional use cases. Sure. The ring isn't exactly biometric. It's just, it's just the hardware key. He doesn't know that I'm actually me. No, yes. He doesn't know that, that it's actually you. Um, there are, specifically with that ring, there are sort of identifying the way you walk, and, but that's something that they are saying that they'll add in the future. But for right now, like the gesture for this specific ring is like to spin it, and it lights up, and that's how it sends the... It's just possession of it. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing with the security key that doesn't have a fingerprint. So you're just tapping it, and you're good to go. Um, okay, so... Our next use case um, that's still in the warehouse, we have the order fulfillment employee. And what happened in the warehouse is that we have many people, many employees, contractors, partners, people come and go. Um, it's a busy environment. Uh, we have a very high turnover rate of employees there. 
And all those employees, they're using uh, shared devices. So um, there is a tablet that one employee uses, he authenticates to it, and five minutes later, another employee comes, uses the same tablet, authenticates to it in a different way. So here we actually need to support, uh, the, the business requirement we need to support is shared devices with a lower cost um, authenticating devices comparing to wearables. Because wearable might be some, might be a little bit more expensive. And for those types of employees that are changing all the time, we do need um, a cheaper option of authentication. So basically, in this use case, we actually, as Jana said, we need to support two different requirements. One is to allow the users to have a low-cost authenticator, and the other is how to deal with a shared device that is used across uh, multiple employees. So in the organization, you have different types of devices. You have a private device or, uh, that, is, uh, that is used by a single user, for example, the employee's uh, laptop or desktop. You have shared devices like a kiosk or, in this example, a tablet that is used uh, by, many, by many users. And then you have the devices where you just don't know, uh, you don't have information about the device. So with the help of PingFed, you can uh, configure uh, and separate between these types of devices. For example, you can reference the source IP address or um, you can look for the, uh, for, the global HTTPS, uh, for the global HTTP address or the DNS. Or, for example, you can check the device uh, certificate. And then you can determine these, uh, to separate between these devices. So in case a user comes from a private device, uh, during the initial login, the user logs in with his username and password, and then he goes to the second factor, and then he's authenticated. In this case, uh, since we needed a low-cost uh, uh, authenticator for high turnover, we can use uh, just regular uh, simple OAuth tokens um, for the users to, to authenticate with. And then in uh, subsequent logins, uh, basically depending on the company policy, the user can enjoy a passwordless um, login where he doesn't have to type in his username or his password and go directly to the second factor and be authenticated. And this policy can apply for as 30 days or whatever your um, company would like to have. In this case of a private device, what we do is we save information about the SSO and MFA session of the user, and that way we can tell that the user was uh, already logged in. In the case of a shared device, we don't save any of that information. So if Alice logs in in the morning to that shared tablet, she has to type in her username and password and then use her authenticator, in this example, the, the um, hard token, and then she's authenticated. And when Bob comes in in the afternoon, he needs to do the same thing all over again. And then what to do with those cases where you don't know where the type of device, in which case we add a checkbox for the user to decide whether this is his own device or not. If the user ticked the box that this is his device, then we go to the uh, private device mode and we keep the information for the user. And if not, we go to the shared device mode and we don't save any information about the user. And of course, if the user did uh, save his uh, information, he can always opt out of the service and, and in which case we will delete the information. Um, so let's continue with another uh, use cases of passwordless authentication. Um, in this case, we have uh, a, an associate who is working from the corporate office and he needs to log into his workstation every day, multiple times a day, like we all do. Uh, and still, every, even in this scenario, we would like to allow the user to have a passwordless uh, login. In this case, unlike the first one that we saw, the user, we do need to know who the user is. Um, however, he won't need to put in his password. So um, here you're about to witness um, a quite different type of passwordless. Because as you're seeing here, the, that's the Windows login screen. And it already has the user saved. So the passwordless experience here is sort of usernameless because the user doesn't have to type in his password because it's part of the operating system. But we are skipping the password step. 
So you can see that the user still has the option to log in with his password, or he can go with his option, which is ping ID. And what is going to happen is that when I will select ping ID, um, any of the ping ID authentication factors will be able to operate. So let's see how it works. So the user selects ping ID. His phone, his ping ID app receives uh, a mobile push. He's authenticated with his fingerprint and he's authenticated. He's logging in to his Windows uh, device. Again, it probably happened very quickly because that's how quick and easy it is. So let's replay it. So instead of password, user selects ping ID. His mobile phone with ping ID mobile app receives push notification. He authenticates with his fingerprint and he's able to access his Windows um, workstation. So this is just one example of Windows. We do have this coming down the road with Mac login. And, sorry. Um, so, so far we've seen um, four use cases for the enterprise. We've seen the passwordless biometric authentication in, um, enabled by FIDO. We saw the wearable authentication as a second factor, again enabled by FIDO with a motive ring. Um, we've seen the shared devices example with any type of authentication factor, and we've seen the passwordless Windows login. So those all were uh, use cases that talk about the enterprise. And if you remember Smart Kitchen, our um, company for this uh, presentation has also consumer use cases. So uh, let's continue talking about passwordless, but in a consumer context way. So um, Smart Kitchen, remember they make smart appliances and one of the appliances they make is a smart fridge. So um, we have here um, Brenda, we'll call her Brenda. She uh, just bought um, her smart fridge. She uh, brings it home. She wants to plug it in. And what she wants to do is to make um, a seamless setup of her fridge. So Brenda is very excited. She just bought a smart uh, fridge. She unpacks it. She uh, plugs it into the electricity. And she sees a QR code, uh, which allows her to take her mobile phone uh, that she has already installed the Smart Kitchen uh, app, so she can scan the QR code, and that's it. The device, the identity is, um, is linked, is paired uh, with her mobile phone, and from now on, she will be able to manage the fridge from her mobile device. Um, we use this uh, very simple example just to, to show how easy it can be uh, to connect identities without having to type in uh, username and password or all sorts of information. I do want to show some other examples and Andre kind of stole our thunder this morning, but what can you do? Um, so, uh, for example, you, you're in a conference, you went into your hotel room, you opened, uh, you turned on the smart TV and you want to log into one of the apps. Uh, you can uh, use uh, the remote control and start typing the username and password, however it is very annoying, at least to me. Or you can take this app that you're trying to log into uh, on your mobile app, scan a QR code and that's it, you're, you're logged in and, in and it's secured. In the same way, if you uh, check in or check out from a hotel kiosk, you can do the same thing. Or on your trade meal, uh, if you want to start streaming your, uh, your favorite, um, uh, from your favorite app, you don't need to type in the username and password. You can use the traditional way, but perhaps you don't want someone uh, looking over your shoulder or you just don't want to do that. So you can sign in using a QR code and easily with the mobile app uh, login, which is both uh, a great user experience as well as secured. So up until now, we presented five use cases and five examples of how you can implement MFA everywhere uh, in a holistic way. I hope we were able to show you how with the help of Ping ID, you can have a unified experience for your employees and uh, a slick experience for the, for the consumer. Let's talk a little bit about uh, intelligence and, uh, and risk-based authentication. 
and see how this uh, layer can be put on top of all of these use cases uh, in order to provide even a, even a better authentication. And obviously, there are many more uh, use cases we weren't able to talk about all of them. So when we talk about intelligence and risk-based authentication, we can say in a very high level that there are four main pillars. One is the user. So what groups are the user part of? Uh, what, when was the user last authenticated? What time of day does he usually uh, authenticate? Another, another factor is the device. And when we say device, we talk about both the accessing device, the device from which the user is accessing, and the authenticating device, the device with which the user is trying to authenticate. There is the application um, that the user is trying to authenticate to. Is it a risky application? Is the user allowed to do certain things on that application? And there is the network that the user is logging in from. So what we'll do now is we show you just a few examples of how we in Ping ID implemented the, um, these pillars. So the first example actually uses PingFed and Ping ID, and you will see that in this example, uh, we actually take into consideration three of the four pillars. We are, uh, we are um, checking the device, the user, and the application. So in this policy chain, the user begins the authentication, PingFed then reaches out to a third-party risk engine. It can be Iovation, for example, in order to check the uh, device uh, reputation. And then PingFed receives a reputation score. If the reputation score is low, meaning the risk is low, perhaps the policy will be that the user can just go into the and log into the protected resource. However, if the risk, um, the reputation score is high, uh, the risk is high, then perhaps we will go to Ping ID in, uh, and then in Ping ID we can apply additional policies. For example, we can say that if the user uh, authenticated within the last 30 minutes, then it, he's okay to, uh, to log in. Uh, or for, exa for example, if the user is trying to log into a very sensitive application, then we will step him up using a, a fingerprint, but if he's trying to log into a low uh, risk application, then we will just send him an SMS, for example. So, uh, in, and then we can step up the user, or perhaps if he's trying to log into an app that he's not allowed to log into, maybe we'll deny him altogether. So you can see that with one policy chain, we actually dealt with three uh, of the pillars, the user, the device, and the application. So let's talk about the fourth pillar, which is the network. And what you're seeing here, the word intelligence, is actually a new initiative in Ping ID. So we are leveraging um, AI and ML algorithms to uh, make smarter decisions based on risk, and all of that to reduce the friction of user experience. So what I'm going to do right now is give you two examples of two features that we have um, coming up. Uh, one of them is the evaluation of the IP reputation. The other one is the evaluation of the um, geo-velocity. Let's start with um, geo-velocity. So, um, do you know what geo-velocity is? You know, but I will explain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, geo-velocity or in other names that you might know, it is like impossible ground speed, impossible travel speed. So that's actually um, our ability to detect anomalies uh, between um, your current login and your previous login. So if you travel at an impossible ground speed, we would detect it as an anomaly. Let's see how it works. So we have um, Alice, our user. She logs in 9 a.m. in Washington. She types in her username and password. Um, she has to do her second factor. She swipes with her Ping ID mobile app. And she's authenticated. She's good to go. She can access to her application. And everything is great. Three hours later, in Cape Town, there is someone else with Alice credentials trying to log in. But what happens? He's denied. So what happened here? Do I need to replay it? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's keep uh, playing. Okay, so what happened here? We detected that um, we detected that there is an impossible ground speed 
uh, between Washington and uh, Cape Town. It was three hours, remember, 9 a.m. Um, and then three hours okay. later, so you cannot travel from Washington to, to Cape Town in three hours unless you have like some sort of a spaceship or <laughs> some other magical transport that takes you um, in three hours to the other side of the world. So we detected that this was um, an abnormal activity and what happened here is that there was a policy in Ping ID, a policy that defined that we have, uh, that we detect geovelocity anomalies and the action to perform when we detect those geovelocity anomalies was to deny the transaction. So this is just one example that in this specific um, implementation, we chose to deny it. However, what we could have done is to try and step up the user to authenticate, and we could have selected um, some more secure authentication factors, like FIDO, for example, for this type of authentication. So um, the next example we're going to talk about is IP reputation. Another way we are covering the network part. So we're IP reputation, we're basically analyzing the risk score of the accessing IP. Um, if it's a high risk, we might, decide to, we might decide to block. If it's a low risk, we might decide to approve or do something else. I am going to try another live demo. I'm hoping it will work. So um, let's try that. You're not seeing the other side of my screen. I switch tabs and it's not showing. No to self, do only videos, not live demos. It breaks the room. Um, the Chrome browser. Okay, no, not no. okay. <laughs> Okay, there from browser. Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, what I'm about to do is to show you a regular login from uh, a Chrome browser. I'm just logging into my doc. Regular login. I'll do this with the username and a password. Um, it has my credentials already saved here. I'm logging in and I'm authenticated. This, that's just because I had the, uh, the policy um, defined to um, approve low risk, um, low risk transactions. The assumption is, and I've pre-checked that, is that the IP, the accessing IP that is uh, the identiverse IP will result in a low risk score and that's actually what happened and that's why I was approved and I was able to gain access to my doc. Now let's try to do the same thing but in a different way. So I'm going to use um, Tor browser um, so Tor browser, what it does, um, it uses some kind of proxy and it sort of tries to disguise the actual um, accessing persona. And the reason that um, we detect those kind of uh, transactions, not from Tor browser specifically, but the ones that are coming like from proxies and someone that's trying to disguise something, um, is risky is because we don't know who actually is trying to access it. So I'll try to log in from, from this browser. Let me just uh, open a new um, tab to make sure that we have a fresh session. That's Tor, that's not us, yeah. I'm logging in with my credentials. <coughs> and it's an error. No, that's not what should happen. Let's try that again. <laughs> we're looking for a different kind of error. Yeah, we're looking for a different kind of error. Let's try it again. I'll relaunch Tor. It's probably because um, the session was open for too long. It happened to us when we were rehearsing, but we didn't learn our, les our lesson. Okay, let's try it again. So that's the login to my dog, the same one I was logging in before with the Chrome browser. Uh, 
and it doesn't work again. Yeah. But what if should, I'm not going to try it again, but what you should have seen here is like, if you're familiar with PingID, we have like this red X that somebody blocked you. Um, if you're interested, if you're not familiar with Ping ID, so you should sign up for the trial. And if you don't want to sign up for a trial, and I don't understand why would you would not want to sign up for the trial, you can come to me and I will show it to you. But we're basically showing like a red X, and we're telling you that you were blocked because your company policy um, prevented you from accessing. So again, this is just one example that um, we prevented a user uh, from access, but we could have asked him to like authenticate. We could have asked ask him to authenticate with another authentication method, with a more secure authentication method like FIDO or something else that we consider as more secure, basically up to implementation. I'm really curious to try that again and to see why it's not working. We didn't pray to the demo god enough. Yeah, so we're please demo it. god, yeah. make it work. Do I, we'll I sacrifice? Can I sacrifice you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it for the last time and... No, it's, it, it, it should work with the bookmark, yeah. It should, it should, yeah, we try that. I know what you mean, like you're storing, like, yeah. Fix that. No. Okay, so you'll have to believe me that yeah. that's what actually happens. And uh, I, I promise you, oh, I actually have it like in a video backup, but that's enough. I ge I'm, I'm guessing you got the point. Um, let's go back to our presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yeah, okay. Dana, back to you. Okay, so we talked about how MFA is evolving and how it is everywhere um, and how with the help of MFA we are able to support zero trust. We also talked about how uh, MFA is becoming intelligent as the next evolutionary step and how uh, risk-based decisions will become the core to MFA. Uh, and all of that is uh, to provide the best balance between the user experience and the level of security. However, this is not the end goal. This is just the beginning. Our goal in, uh, in, in Ping, our vision is zero login, a world where a user uh, doesn't hardly ever need to authenticate in order to uh, log in to any application. He doesn't have to actively authenticate. Uh, however, we can still manage a high level of security and protect these applications that he's trying to log into. Our vision is to break the paradigm that you have to find a balance and you have to compromise between a great user experience and, uh, and a good security level, but rather let them uh, go hand in hand and while you have an awesome user experience, also have the best possible um, uh, security level. And obviously, as Jana said, with the help of AI and machine learning, we are going to do that. Uh, I think that's complete, that completes yes, our session. Yes, questions. Yeah. And remember that we do have security keys to but give But only away. 80. Yeah, so, um, and don't ask us hard questions. Oh, is that part of the criteria? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have like a mic, a runner? No, we don't, so let's do it. Um, Greg, okay. you're first. We will repeat. We will, yeah. So for, for Windows, Ping ID login, is that available now? Um, so uh, Greg was asking if uh, Ping ID Windows login is available right now. Um, it is a work in progress. We are working on it. We don't have a final date yet, but we're hoping that it's soon. Do you need beta testing? We'll sign you up. <laughs> what about the Hello Windows server? The, sorry? Hello Windows server? OK, the availability? Okay, so um, I don't know your name, but um, he was asking about the availability of Windows Hello. So Windows Hello availability um, comes in two parts. The first part is the second factor authentication, just like you saw with the ring. That's something that will be available. When, Gabby? Next week. <laughs> we are releasing it next week. And um, the other part, the passwordless, is also a work in progress. That will be available later on. Um, My question is about the quality of IP address geolocation. And the second part of the question is, in your example, you were using a browser that manipulated that IP address to get the 
the wrong answer, but presumably people can do the opposite thing, which is to manipulate the IP address to give a valid answer. Um, how useful is that as a security trust? Okay, so uh, what Mike was asking is uh, first is like the accuracy, right? The accuracy the of the geolocation. Yeah. And the second question that Mike was asking is like, how do we prevent like the false positive, true negative or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Um, so about the accuracy, um, the, I think right or the accuracy is like about like city level 50, um, 50 kilometer radius. That's our accuracy level. Um, and about the, sorry? Okay, so um, if, if we detect, uh, uh, what happens with this feature is that if we detect like um, a very small um, um, distance between the two points, we're kind of not sure that we can actually detect this anomaly, so we assume it's not if it's like too small of a range. Um, and the other part of your question that um, was about like how can we say that someone is trying like to um, impersonate a good IP. Um, so we trust our smart decisions and our sources um, to make sure that we know who the good IPs are. And there's also other ways to detect, like not, just, not just static lists, we do have um, and other information about if someone is trying to access from a proxy or something like that. So we're taking a lot of factors in consideration. <coughs> yes. In, in terms of OS authentication, how it happens in the shared account? Sorry, which authentication? In the OS authentication. Yes. It will be in the shared account when one, let's say, uh, desktop is being shared with two, three people. Okay. So okay. So, um, Sorry, I don't know your name, but the question was, um, what happens with OS token authentication when we have a shared device? How do we know who the account is? Or, okay. So basically the assumption is that in that use case, the OS token is private. The shared device is the accessing device and the authenticating devices are private. So, um, sorry? Windows login or OS token? Oh, okay. oh, sorry. So I, I'm, I misunderstood the question. So can you ask it again? In terms of OS, Windows login or authentication, if the desktop is shared between the multiple uh, Yes. How, how this MFA will kick in? Okay, okay, that, 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 that's a good question. And the question is, uh, when we do Windows login in a passwordless way, right? How do we differentiate between users? So if you remember, um, I'll go back to the... Um, the Windows login slide. No, skip way to, no, where was it? The Windows login, we know who the user is. Yeah. Basically. We know who the user is. is. Um, it's either stored um, as part of your operating system or you have to type it in so we know who you are and we know which authenticating devices you have so we know which one to to prompt. You need, it's only passwordless, but it's not user nameless. Yes. Let's do a question from that side. Yes. Is the What do you mean? Okay, so the I will repeat the question. The question is, do we have like a static configuration of what's considered a, an abnormal travel speed? So the question for right now is yes. Um, it's still a preview feature. We're still trying to gather some feedbacks to see if we do need to make it configurable, but it's definitely something that's possible. Um, let's do some question from that side of the room. Yes. I was interested in your kitchen appliance. You, you want to buy the fridge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Several members of the family who want that QR code, so 
Dana, do you want to yes. take it? Yes, so um, even after the first user um, connected to the, mob, to the fridge, other users can connect to it and scan, the, and scan it. So it, it doesn't have to be just the, the first one. Uh, if you can be also your wife. Yeah, but I mean, like when you're in the kitchen app, the kitchen app itself has to do some gathering of information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to scan the uh, yeah, so can you repeat the question? Sorry. Like a person who has the device. Mm -hmm. The they, mobile device? Like, yeah, the kitchen app that they download, they have to get information about them. Oh, okay. So, okay. so before she bought the fridge, she downloaded the application. She logged in. She created an account. So she's already a known user in that mobile application. And then every device that she wants, every appliance that she wants to add, she just scans it and she's able to add it to her account. I hope I answered your yeah. question. I'm just thinking, like, what, what would stop somebody else from, like, another person who's in the area to just be able to download the app with that information in and say, I got my QR code. They can download the app, but... But they don't have the user the, that signs yeah, they in don't, they don't have the to user. the application. Yeah. So if, if I take the example of the hotel, for example, let's take this example, and I, I have my favorite streaming app, I have that, uh, I have that mobile app uh, on my device, uh, on my mobile app, and I, uh, I have my username, password, I have my account, then I, I uh, turn on the smart TV, I see the QR code, and then, um, and then I, my information, uh, my username and, and, and my identity, sorry, is, um, is then with the help of the QR code enables me to log in to that uh, application on the, on the television. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. So um, the question: uh, Do we take uh, in consideration different users with different types of, of type of behaviors, like executives that are constantly traveling, or warehouse employees that don't constantly, that are not Only constantly traveling travel, between yeah. countries? So what you can do is you can configure those types of anomaly detection only on specific user groups. So you can configure uh, the anomaly detection only for uh, the executives or some other groups that you think that it's more risky for them. Uh, to detect that, and yeah. Next question, yes. I'm Rick. Um, so my question is, can you do, can you set that contextual signal signaling process through ping ID, or do you need to uh, have pair it with ping fat rate or ping? Line? Which contextual uh, signal? Uh, let's say let's say the, the signaling uh, that would either positively or negatively affect. The so currently, it's done through Ping ID. You don't need Ping Fed to do that. And the question was, do you need Ping Fed to do that? As a, I'll take question from that side. Yes. Yes, we are integrated with ADFS. Okay, so it's, it's just you can invoke. Yes, you, you can invoke all the flows that you saw here from ADFS. Next question. Yes. You mean what do we show if it's Windows Hello or something else? Okay, so the way we detect it is sort of static. If it's a Windows machine, we show Windows Hello. If we detect it's an Android operating system, so it's Android biometrics. That's the detection from a user agent. Yes. <laughs> a lot of questions. You showed about like basically using Windows Hello, but you never showed about duplication or management about the Windows Hello duplication. Basically, if I lost my laptop. Okay. 
So um, the question is about account recovery uh, when there is Windows Hello. But that's like a very long story to tell. Please come find me later or email me. We do have our emails right here. Um, next question. <laughs> yes. For passwordless to a mobile device, do you guys have like a ping app for the mobile device? Do you guys have a white paper version of that? So um, we have our ping ID app. And in some point in time, we will have a white label version, but you can use our APIs. Yes. Does your IP address reputation support IPv6? Um, yes, right? We do. Next question. Yes. You, <laughs> you were so surprised that I said to you. Will these features be available? I'm currently using Ping ID. Will they just show up, these new features? Or do I have to load something? Uh, which features? The, all of them? Yeah, all, the, the ones you said are coming up. OK, um, the uh, FIDO ones, uh, you would have to turn on the web authentication as an authentication method. You will see it in your web portal. Um, for the intelligence features, you do have to sign up for a preview. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so for Android, it's Android 6 and up. And the browser that you're using has to support WebAuthn. With iOS, it's not supported yet. Yes. So as far as uh, password limits, are you, from big research, have you guys looked at this is limited to one FIDO device or multiple devices? And if it's multiple, have you seen a, a threshold where you're like, OK, it has to like three devices. That's too much. OK, so the question is about threshold of uh, FIDO devices. Um, basically, the threshold is according to your admin configuration. Um, what it's is not our, limited. It's to, not limited yeah, to yeah. FIDO yeah. devices. It's yeah. for every. If, for all device. your authenticating devices, it would not limit specific yeah. Yeah, but um, for like FIDO. A user, have you found that too many devices <coughs> no. Specifically for FIDO or no? No, no. But every organization can choose. Yeah. yeah. Every and organization can, yeah. can choose and their own threshold. And unfortunately, our best, our best practice shows that uh, most users don't have too many devices. So not necessarily the best practice. Yes. The reality. The reality is not the best practice. Yeah. I yeah. think we're out of time. Yes. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you.